Hello everybody, hope you're all having a wonderful time at OSC. I wish I could be there with you, but unfortunately I managed to catch COVID just before the conference. Um, so if you're watching this, I'm still too sick to come and join you on Saturday. Um, hope Friday was great. Hope Sunday's going to be awesome. Um, and yeah, I'm here to talk to you about the OpenSUSE Micro S desktop. So the general premise of, of this entire presentation is, you know, why should you run the OpenSUSE Micro S desktop? And if I wanted to be, this could be the shortest presentation I ever gave because the answer is really simple. It's the best Linux desktop. Oh no, full stop, the end. Like, it's the only desktop I use. It's the only desktop I recommend. Yes, OpenSUSE does lots of awesome other stuff, but simple facts, it's the best thing we've got. In fact, I'd go one step further actually um, and say it's the best desktop. You know, I have had dalliances with Windows. I also have a Mac that I use for photography, but you know, in terms of a general purpose desktop machine, the micro S desktop is the best. So, you know, if you don't want to listen to me rambling on for <laughs> another half hour or so, you know, there you go. That's all you need to know. Download it, install it, it's the best. But if you do want to, <laughs> yeah listen to me ramble on for a bit and you don't know who I am and why the heck you know should my opinion even matter um yeah my name is Richard I think I said that already I've been in OpenSUSE now for like 20 years like since it began you know I've been a desktop user that whole time um in the in the SUSE world I've been everything from QA to release engineering to board members of OpenSUSE to the chairperson these days, I work at SUSE as a distribution architect, so designing new distributions. And the reason I'm talking to you about the MicroS desktop is because I created the MicroS desktop. And really to understand how I could say those very bold statements at the beginning, you do kind of need to know a little bit about how I was thinking about this and, and like what mindset is behind it to really kind of understand where I'm coming from when I say it's the best. So. That's where I'm going to start. I'm going to talk about the mindset of microOS generally and microOS desktop in a bit more detail. Give a brief introduction to the platform. Um, explain a little bit how it's architected and how it's designed. That includes then going into details about Flatpak and Flathub, and then DistroBox, and then a little bit about transactional update, and then finish off with the future of the microOS desktop. So, mindset. You know, been doing Linux for 20 years, right? You know, Linux is awesome. And some of the things that everybody really praises when they talk about Linux is how wonderfully customizable it is. You know, it can do everything. It's a Swiss Army knife. You can have it be your mail server. You can have it be your desktop client. You can have it do both of those things at the same time. You know, therefore, it can also be very multi-purpose. You know, it doesn't just have to do just one job. And, you know, it's way better than Windows, it's way better than Mac, it's super valuable. And that's what we've been telling ourselves and everybody for the last 20 plus years. The reality though is, you know, for everything that Linux is awesome with, you know, it's also terrible. You know, that customization means everybody's installation is different. It contains untested stuff, you know, tested in a you know, combined in a, a way that we just couldn't test even with OpenQA. You know, we can't test every possible combination of every possible package from a 15,000 package code base. That, that, that is just impossible. And, you know, that multi-purpose benefit um, that, make, that, you know, has given uh, Linux such strength for so long is also part of the problem. You know, everybody's expecting everything to work all of the time, even when it's a server and a desktop running in an edge environment as a VM all at the same time. You know, that's that's a tall order for any operating system. You know, it can't do everything everywhere all at once. You know, at some point, you know, when you're designing a system, you need to have some idea of how is this thing going to be used so you can then make sensible choices and maybe not support every possible option out there because you know this one choice is best and these problems get avoided and you just can't do that if you're trying to be the multi-purpose pick everything for everybody all the time 
And yeah, that really does impact the reliability of Linux systems. You know, Linux systems are wonderfully reliable until you touch them. Because anything can be installed at any time. The running system can be impacted by some new RPM or package or whatever being installed. And then, you know, your perfectly running system suddenly behaves differently than it used to. And you don't necessarily know how to get back to how it used to work. And so, you know, when I talk about this, people quite often say, well, you know, but Linux is about choice and it isn't, you know, uh, at least from my point of view, you know, Linux is about good engineering and good engineering means quite often making choices for the users so they don't have to or they can't or so they avoid problems which you know can be avoided by that choice you know software engineering is a hard task there's a million different things out there especially in the open source world and you know we need to be you know be picky and we need to look at these things and think okay what is the best choice for the task at hand forget about the rest don't give them as options don't deal with the bug reports that you're going to have to deal with if you do make it as an option you know make the choices for the user don't necessarily give them every single choice on their plate because they're just going to get themselves in trouble when they do and then that trouble ends up being you know nasty bug reports and nasty mailing list threads and contributors blaming themselves out trying to fix something which they're never going to use anyway so you know it doesn't work from any way you cut it you know it doesn't work in a business sense either because you know customers aren't going to want to buy something which breaks on them because they were allowed to break it and it doesn't work in a community sense either because yeah, that's just how you burn out contributors running around chasing their tail trying to make everybody happy and not actually getting the thing done that they wanted to start with. And microOS generally, the, the, the general microOS platform, you know, kind of exists to tackle some of these problems head on. You know, the reliability is handled by not having the system be modified or modifiable at runtime. You know, the read -only, there's a read-only root file system. You can't change the binaries on disk once they're there, you know, at least during the boot time, you know, during the boot system while it's booted. So it's always going to behave the same way. You know, every time you boot it, it's going to behave the same way it last booted unless you patched in between. This also, this focus on being more selective with what's on the, the operating system and being more selective about how things are there, make the thing way more scalable. You know, you can have thousands of instances of this without any problem because you're not having to worry about configuring you know, all the individual instances at runtime. You know, you shouldn't be you know, manually tinkering with your machine. If you're manually looking at the shell, something has gone horribly wrong. Um, also, getting rid of the concept of everything should be single purpose. So, so everything should be multi-purpose, you know, so really picking an operating system to be a single purpose operating system, you know, that, this micro every micro instance should be there to do just one job that job could be running a web server that job could be actually running many web servers and other miscellaneous stuff via containers because in that case really the the container runtime is the one job um but as far as the operating system is concerned you shouldn't be necessarily worrying about you know potentially hundreds of different packages all needing to be updated or to keep your system secure or to keep the services running like no just keep the system simple have as few things on there that need to be worried about automate the whole problem away as much as you can um and then when you do have to update make that update as reliable as possible which in the case of micro s you know we have automatic updating and automatic recovery when there are anything that goes horribly wrong If you don't already know, microOS is based on OpenSUSE Tumbleweed, um, kind of like um, other better, newer SUSE distributions. This, you know, the idea of basically having like one code base and having multiple products flying out of it. So the factory code base has the traditional Tumbleweed distribution and microOS coming from it. Um, I would actually argue that regular microOS is the perfect community server OS. I know what I just said about the desktop being the best desktop. I also say microOS is the best server. Better than Leap, 
better than tumbleweed, better than anything else. You know, this needs the mindset change to go with it. You know, you're not going to be happy if you're running micro OS as your web, your web server and mail server and blah, 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 or using RPM the old fashioned way. But if you focus on the operating system being there for a single purpose, that single purpose might be running a bunch of containers to get sort of the feel of an old fashioned server, you know, then the OS kind of part of it just drifts away. Like my little box behind me in the corner here, you know, I can't think of the last time I had to SSH into that to fix it. Like it just sits there, it runs all of my stuff, it reboots itself, everything is good. And yes, you know, there's, probably, there's been lots of talk, I guess, at the conference about ALP and, you know, MicroS is, I would say, the inspiration for a lot of what you're seeing in ALP. Um, you know, ALP takes it a different route and, and goes further and, you know, lots of interesting stuff there. But, you know, you yeah, MicroS is the upstream for that. It is the inspiration for that. Um, you know, I'm really excited about how those commercial products are going to look in the future. Isn't going to change what I just said though about MicroS being the best community server OS. That's, I'm pretty sure I'm locked into that for life now. So that's the server. What about the desktop? Well, first a little bit about, again, mindset, you know, how do I see the desktops? Why the heck did I make this thing? You know, desktops are special. You know, they, they unlike a server, they can't be automated or hidden away the same way that yeah, a server can the same way that micro OS basically expects you to do. You know, you, you're always going to be sitting in front of a desktop, just like I'm sitting in front of this one now giving this presentation. So, you know, it has to be a nice, inviting, reliable platform. You know, you need to be able to use it for work and for fun stuff and videos and all that other stuff. And you can make a fair argument that, in fact, you know, even you know even in sort of non mission critical environments like desktops are actually kind of like need to be more reliable than your server right because if your desktop's broken you know you can't do anything if your server's broken you can at least run your desktop like you know it it's you know it's the gateway to everything you do in the modern world so it's got to be you know just as reliable if not more so than than any server out there and so that's really kind of why I wanted to build the micro S desktop. I wanted to, you know, take that same basic mindset of, you know, just doing one job, having a totally reliable platform and then building upon it, you know, as a desktop operating system um, with those extra caveats that, you know, desktops are special. It, it's a bigger problem than the, the server one, the regular micro S takes. So starts at the same place you know it's regular predictable immutable just like regular micro os you know we use the same code base etc but um it is somewhat more opinionated than regular old micro os yeah you know primarily we, we you know we kind of only really support gnome um there is a, a kde variant but it's still very much in alpha you know the best you could say is possibly entering beta soon Whereas the Microsoft desktop is, you know, release quality and will be officially released sometime soon. I explain about that in a minute. Um, unlike regular MicroOS and also unlike like any other open SUSE distribution, you know, we're going for a very sort of particular vision, you know, it's something that isn't this customizable Swiss army knife where you can install whatever the heck you want and mix and match all this different stuff. You know, it's going much more for a Chromebook like experience and being way less customizable than Tumbleweed or Leap. That's that's actually part of the goal. Like, you know, we've got Tumbleweed and Leap. If you want a customizable desktop, use them. If you want something that just works and doesn't get in your way, that's what the Microsoft desktop is really for. And it really has to work. You know, I want it to be as small as possible, but not at the expense of functionality. So things like printing, gaming, media production, like I'm you recording this, all work and, and need to work also right out of the box because you know if it doesn't work first time especially with something new and a new concept like the micro s desktop people are just going to walk away so there is this constant focus on making sure you know we're making choices that that work that work first time and you shouldn't need to be messing around with configuration for things like display managers and graphic settings and DPIs and all that kind of stuff just to get to a point where you can use your machine. And yeah, to kind of give you a really simple basic example of what it looks like, it looks like this. This is the screenshot of my desktop. Um, it's not exactly shiny fancy. It's a 
fill in on desktop. As you can see at the bottom there, there's a whole bunch of applications. Everything from, well, I think I'll talk about that later, but um, you know, everything from LibreOffice and proprietary stuff like Teams to you know regular terminal software and regular GNOME software. It's just there to work. It's not necessarily there to look like the fanciest thing in the planet, but I think it looks pretty good. In terms of this design, um, I wanted to kind of show this architecture diagram to kind of give a better explanation of, of how I see the desktop, uh, the micro desktop in particular, um, and how the whole kind of thing is, is structured. The, these aren't, this isn't a sort of pure technically truthful diagram, but it's you know good enough to kind of illustrate at least how we think about it when we're, when we're talking about it among the community. You know, there's a base OS at the bottom of this whole stack that includes in essence, regular micro OS and regular GNOME without applications uh, on top of it. Basically, we're using like a, a trimmed down, customized GNOME pattern that we maintain ourselves. No recommended packages, nothing like that. Like that, that wouldn't make sense. But just the basics to give you the GNOME desktop environment. Um, and I think I think the mo the only kind of application I really include there, uh, is like a terminal, because if something goes horribly wrong, you can need a terminal. And if something goes horribly wrong, you know, things high up the stack might not be working. So best to put the terminal there. But basically, all the other applications, oh, and of course, the software store. Um, so you can get the other applications, but besides that, nothing in there from the basic level. Above that, I'm going to ignore the right-hand side of the slide for the moment. Uh, above that, we have flat packs from Flathub. Like I mentioned, we are, we have the GNOME software store in there, so that's pre-configured, no messing around with configuration or anything like that, to automatically show you all the flat packs from from Flatter, which I go into more detail in a minute. Alongside that, DistroBox has a really cool feature uh, for exporting graphical applications that are in a container. I'll talk about more of that later. And then above that, for command line applications, you know, so anything on the terminal, developer -y stuff, you know, software packaging, writing code, Git, etc. We have DistroBox, um, and I go into great detail about that, but in essence, DistroBox is a nice, simple, read-write environment of well, whatever distro you want. So in our case, we're typically using Tumbleweed, because um, Tumbleweed is best for that. But, you know, if you want to have the micro desktop and then use it to, you know, run a whole bunch of Ubuntu stuff, pff, fine, we can do that, or Fedora, or whatever. And then on the right-hand side, which, you know, I don't really recommend, but it's there from a technical level, you know, you have the ability with transactional updates to install whatever RPM packages you want, graphical, command line, doesn't really matter. But of course, they're going to bring in dependencies, they're going to modify the base system, so, you know, there's there's risks and caveats that come with that. So, in plain English, all the applications on Microsoft desktop, be they graphical or terminal, should be ideally isolated from the base system. That's why we use FlatHub as the main way of getting graphical applications on your Microsoft desktop. And that's why we use DistroBox as the main way of getting command line applications on your desktop. And if you want, you can use Transactional Update to install any other RPM from Tumbleweed on there. My recommendation would be to avoid doing that as much as you can, but you know, sometimes it's the only option that works. Sometimes packages are weird. So a little bit more about Flatpak and Flathub. Flatpak, if you don't know, um, is a, a universal packaging format for graphical applications. It's built, it's, you know, built sort of distro neutrally, you know, it's there for any Linux distribution, MicroOS, Ubuntu, Tumbleweed, Fedora, you name it, it works there. It has a very interesting structure where the applications are effectively, I say bundled, but that sounds like it's gonna be a whole bunch of duplication and there isn't. Um, the applications are nicely tied to common runtimes, so collections of libraries that, you know, for example, with GNOME, you know, every GNOME application is going to use the same GNOME libraries because it's a GNOME application. Every KDE application is going to use the same libraries because it's a KDE application and so on and so forth. So in most cases, you know, most graphical applications exist to one of these 
handful of ecosystems of libraries and so those are in essence managed separately as kind of micro distros for flat packs and then when you go to your app store and you click it you're not having to worry about any of that you just you get everything on your machine and these things are all managed but the nice thing of that looking behind the scenes is in essence flat packs are just as reliable just as well maintained just you know have all the benefits of linux distribution packaging without every Linux distribution having to do the packaging again. So it's like the best of both worlds, right? Like it's stable, it's maintained. There's someone there maintaining, checking for CVEs and the like and getting them out to everybody. But it's not that work being done 20 different times in 20 different distros. And then if there is a developer who has some weird or wonderful custom library that they need to bundle in, that, get, that can get bundled in as well. And then even if you don't necessarily trust all of those maintainers as well as you would a typical distro maintainer, it doesn't really matter because unlike distro packages, flat packs are you know, not installed as root. Well, flat packs on Microsoft desktop are not installed on root. Other distributions might do that. And all flat packs are run the sandbox. So you know, there's less chance for a flat pack doing nasty things on your machine anyway. And even when they do can do stuff on your machine, that is limited by the sandbox and you can see uh, a rough description of what is sandboxed before you download anything and in fact you can also customize that with tools like flat seal which also can be downloaded as a flat pack so you know there's a whole ecosystem there now there's, there's, you don't need to worry about necessarily sticking with one distro in order to just to get all of the basic software out there um this diagram basically shows what I was just describing. So your typical application is running in a sandbox. That application may have data inside the application. It yeah, will have code, will have libraries. That's gonna rely on other libraries as well. Those libraries will come from a runtime. So all of the applications on this diagram could end up being using the same runtime. And then you just have the application with its own libraries and its own code. All of this stuff is deduplicated among each other. So, you know, that, you know, you're not having to worry about 20 different copies of the same runtime. But on the flip side, you know, you can have different versions of the runtime at different levels perfectly happily. So, you know, you wanna run some ancient KDE application and some ancient GNOME application next to all the new ones, you totally can. You can stick with whatever version of whatever you want for however long you want it. Um, and, you know, of course, some of those things might not be updated as well as they could be, but the risk is somewhat mitigated by the fact the thing is sandboxed anyway. And then there are limited ways through that sandbox, which what Flatpak calls portals, which basically limit things like which areas in your home directory can it see, which dialog box is going to handle with, you know, what can it do to the operating system, etc. Most flat packs, and in the case of the Microsoft desktop, all flat packs which we can figure out of the box, come from this wonderful service called Flathub. It's a vendor neutral, distribution neutral, Flathub app store, or flat pack app store, to describe it better. There's thousands of applications there. It's the best place to be getting flat packs. Yes, we could make our own open SUSE if we felt like it, but what's the point when there's an entire open source community already doing the work perfectly well anyway? including reviews and worrying about the legal stuff, especially the legal stuff of like proprietary stuff. Um, and yes, you can get proprietary applications in there, things like Spotify, MS Teams, Minecraft, uh, Visual Studio Code, all packages, flat, flat packs, all available from Flathub. It, it completely eliminates the ageless open SUSE problem of needing codecs because the applications come with the codecs they need. In fact, they come with the codecs the developer bundled with them. And, you know, any worries about redistribution are flat hubs and the developer's problem, uh, not OpenSUSE's. So, <laughs> you know, that never ending legal problem that OpenSUSE has had for so long kind of gets sidestepped by this, you know, we're not providing the software, flat hub is. Um, and, you know, most of the applications you'd ever need are already there. And many of the applications are actually now maintained by the upstream developers. So for example, things like LibreOffice, you know, if you're using the LibreOffice Flatpak, you're using LibreOffice's LibreOffice Flatpak. It's not some, you know, it's not some other random volunteer doing it. 
Um, so at the you know, worst case, you can argue it's as good as any distro packaging. Best case, you can actually argue that it's probably better these days. As heretical it is for me to say as a distro package. And in the micro S desktop on the GNOME side of things, we've made this absolutely and utterly seamless. So on a completely fresh installation, you click on the software icon in your tray at the bottom there, which is one of the few icons you see because we, we install a couple of flatbacks straight by default, things like Firefox, but really we want everything to be as vanilla as possible. And then, you know, you load up this, Everything there is, yeah, loads up nice and quickly, way quicker than any GNOME software or Discover um, typically does on any other open source distribution because there they load up the package manager and the package manager has to refresh. And, you know, that takes 30, 40 seconds. This takes like four. So, you know, way quicker, way faster, way nicer. Just get everything from Flathub all in one place, all with a nice clean interface all the applications are there once you install the applications this is actually from the machine i'm doing this demonstration from you know you get a nice clear list of stuff in there where you can see how much space is being used and uninstall the ones you don't want to use the updates are kind of pointless in the sense of it auto updates so it auto updates it auto does everything there's no reboots needed because flatbacks are separate from the base system so it just takes care of itself and you can click on that button and make sure that it's taking care of itself. And then when you are installing something, you get this nice graphical explanation of what's going on. You may see something like this in GNOME software on, on a traditional OpenSUSE distro, but all of in that case, you know, you're getting the RPM package. In this case, you're getting the package from Flatpak as a Flatpak from Flathub. And so all of this metadata is directly tied to that so you can for example see that you know there's a 2.1 megabyte download size because this machine already has the gnome runtime on it nothing else is needed there's just a tiny little application just to get me my mapping software it's perfectly safe the sandbox has no network has network access but the code's been audited it can't access any of my files it can't access my home directory even you know it's a desktop app and you know it's even got an age rating because they've got metadata for that. Um, and you can see this thing was updated four weeks ago when there was the GNOME 44 update. Um, and typically speaking, things like that, you know, I, you typically get the flat packs for things like GNOME applications on the same day or the day before there is a GNOME release. So works perfectly nicely with the micro desktop where we're typically also pumping out the GNOME updates within a day or two of them being available upstream. But if you end up with a mismatch, for example, if we have OpenQA fail a test and you know the GNOME base system isn't ready, Flatpaks make sure this is all going to work. So you know there's no problem of having a slightly newer application running on a slightly older base OS. That's perfect. It's all isolated from each other, and where you go, you can enjoy your new software without having to have any problems the whole time. Away from the graphical side of things, though. You know, as much as I think for some people, that's probably all you need, you know, on a Linux desktop, if you're just doing graphical applications all the time. As a developer, you know, there's times I need to develop. And that means using command line tools. And on the micro desktop, that really means using DistroBox. Um, it was inspired by tools you may have heard of already called uh, Toolbox. Uh, they're actually separate tools, but they're both called Toolbox from Fedora Core OS and, and OpenSUSE Micro OS. In those cases, you know, they they were originally designed to be toolboxes for doing like diagnostic work on a Micro OS server. This robot takes that uh, <laughs> to the absolute extreme. You know, it's not just for debugging a machine now. It's a fully fledged environment for, yeah, in a container. So it's a fully fledged read write environment, perfect for a read only system just like the micro S desktop. You can be any distribution that you want, although as I explained in this, uh, yeah, as I have on the slide there, um, the micro S desktop actually has a highly optimized default container. Um, so instead of a normal distro box in, uh, run where you pick your distro, it downloads that vanilla distro container and installs a whole bunch of fancy helper stuff to do some other really cool features I talk about in a minute. In the case of the micro S desktop, 
in line with the whole mindset of just being perfect out of the box, that's already all done. Our container already does that. So you run DistroBox, it pulls the container, everything's done. You know, so no mess, no fuss, no waiting. It's using Podman or Docker in the in the background. In the case of the MicroS desktop, it's using Podman. It's very tightly integrated into the host OS. So things like sharing your home directory, using external storage, passing to USB devices, audio and graphical applications can all work from a distro box. Really, it's like the best thing since sliced bread if you're a developer wanting to use terminal applications or any application that you can't install as a flat pack, really. The core problem that it solves is, is this one, you know, on a fresh micro S desktop installation, let's say you're a weirdo who likes to use nano. I don't, but it's a good example. You know, you load up your terminal, like I mentioned already, it's one of those applications, which is always there, even on a micro S desktop and you run nano and it's not found. And you know, this is an open SUSE machine. So you do a usual zip it in nano and it gets detected as a transactional server or a transactional system. I wouldn't really call it a server, but get the idea. And Zipper says, you know, you have to use transactional update to modify the system, but we don't want to modify the system. We don't want to mess around with the base OS if we can avoid doing so. So we run the simple command distro box enter, or, or in fact, on most of my machines, I have an icon, which basically does the same as distro box enter. Um, in fact, DistroBox puts it there by default after the first time you enter it. So you click on that, you get your new terminal up. And Nano isn't in the container either, but your traditional OpenSUSE commands work perfectly fine in that container in that environment. So you, in, you can quite happily install Nano from the repositories just like normal. And there you go. You have a working Nano air terminal on a micro S desktop. This is like just the perfect basic use case, you know, for, for all the default stuff. When you really start getting developing on a micro desktop more heavily, you know, this box just gets better and better and better. You know, uh, trying to sort of think of a, uh, uh, an example of, of, you know, as a Python developer, right? You've got m almost certainly more than one Python version you need to worry about, more than one Python environment you know, messing around possibly with different versions of distributions with different Python packages and still trying to get your thing working there. Well, the distro box, you can quite happily fire up a different distro box for every different Python version, every different version of Tumbleweed or Leap or Slee or Alp or whatever. And you can, yeah, get the work you want done there without needing to mess around with VMs. There's tools like distro box update. So, all of them can get updated centrally without you having to, like you would with VMs, going into each one and updating them. Like, that eh, DistroBox knows about that. You can update them all. You don't have to mess around with that. So you can have all of these different environments for all these different scenarios that you need to handle. Um, if you really get into it and want to start customizing it, there is the OpenSUSE DistroBox container, the one I mentioned earlier, which has all the optimizations baked in, so you don't have to wait for DistroBox to install the extra stuff um, and yeah you can just make your own docker file from that add the things you want to use and away you go you know set that as the default image in distrobox rc and that's it um, and yeah like i mentioned and, and like i would recommend and like i wouldn't be surprised if it ends up being a default someday soon um, you know you can use this distrobox as kind of your default shell as your terminal in gnome so, you know, adding it as an extra profile to the system. So, you know, in fact, I know in my case, it is the default one. So when I click on the terminal by default, I get a distro box, my default distro box. And then in the uh, GNOME terminal application, as you can see in the top left hand corner there, there's the little plus symbol and the little drop down next to it. The drop down shows all the other profiles which are available. So in there, you can then still have the, the system terminal for the few times you may need to get a shell on the base OS. Um, and then if you're crazy like me and doing lots of different things in lots of different distro boxes, I quite often have my common go-to ones there. So I don't even have to bother remembering container names or that kind of thing. It's there, my, yeah, my packaging container is there. I click it, I'm in there, done. 
Talking about my packaging container, um, there is a special packaging container for DistroBox. Um, <laughs> this originally started life as my personal container for doing my daily job when I was a release manager for Tumbleweed. Um, you know, I needed to have OSC, I needed to have things like the staging plugins and the cycle plugins and the origin plugins and all the OpenSUSE release tools. Um, and the, I was originally made just maintaining this in my home project in OpenSUSE in the OBS. And then I just kind of realized, wait, wait a second, like anybody who's packaging on any SUSE distro is going to be able to benefit from this. You know, there's other release engineers and release managers who could or should be used in the micro S desktop. So, you know, make it available for everybody. So it now is, um, that is the URL. There is a really nice guide on the wiki about how to use it. Um, but in terms of really simple beginning, you need to create a distro box container for it. The typical command would look something like this. So really kind of simple, distro box create, you give the container a name. I typically call mine PKG because I like short names for my containers I'm going to be using a lot. And then you put in the URL for the container and you can or can or can not, if you don't want to, um, have minus minus root. That will run the container as root, obviously. If you're going to use OSC build to actually compile your own packages, you need that because OSC needs to have a whole bunch of privilege. If you're not going to run your, yeah, run OSC build, you don't need that at all. Um, to be honest, these days, I don't really ever use my rootful packaging container. I just throw everything at OBS and I make that OBS's problem. So you don't really need to mess around with that. And then, yeah, every time you want to run the container, you would have to type in distro box enter PKG. Or if you're lazy like me, you just make it a terminal profile and you just click on the drop down and away you go. And yes, as I mentioned way at the beginning, one of the really cool features, especially when you're talking about the micro S desktop, where, you know, ideally everything would be in a flat pack, but not everything is yet. You know, there's plenty of stuff that if it isn't a flat pack yet, you know, it probably is going to be soon. But meanwhile, you know, you still want to get it from somewhere. Well, DistroBox has the ability to export graphical applications from a container. Exporting basically means like creating a shortcut in your desktop environment that will auto start the container and then run the application from the container and make sure all the graphical stuff magically works. So for example, if you wanted to install something like MPV, you could just start any distro box, install the package that you want, use distro box export to export the application shortcut. And then yeah, on your GNOME shell, you're going to have an MPV shortcut that looks just like a regular MPV shortcut and you're going to click it and the window is going to appear just like MPV normally would. And you wouldn't necessarily even know that this is running from a container. Um, and this is of course, especially cool if you know, you're thinking about third party applications, Ubuntu applications that only exist for the Ubuntu ecosystem, Fedora, etc. you know, any other distribution that isn't as cool as ours, you know, yeah make a distro box for those environments, install whatever application you have there that you couldn't normally get on an OpenSUSE machine and export it. You don't have to worry about all the nonsense of really looking after a full Ubuntu environment forever, and you can still get the application you need. This is one of the reasons why the micro desktop is the best thing ever. And then now back down to the base system, and something that you shouldn't be using every day, we have transactional update. And the reason you shouldn't be using it every day is really, from my point of view, you shouldn't need to. You know, any change to a system should be applying reliably, reproducibly, and reversibly. Transactional updates do this, you know, they're entirely atomic. So the entire update applies every single package, every single file change or nothing at all. And the way it works is by doing everything in a BTFS snapshot alongside the running system. So the running system never gets impacted. It's not going to change any libraries. Your desktop shell isn't going to crash. X or Wayland or whatever isn't going to suddenly have a weird issue because the driver's changed. None of that ever happens. You don't basically have any change to your system until you reboot. And in the case of the micro S desktop, these updates are fully automated. 
and will happen automatically either in the middle of the night because that's the timer that we inherited from from regular micro OS. Um, so you know between midnight and 2 a.m. or of course because this is a desktop right you know your system isn't likely to be on between 0 and 2 a.m. you know you might have suspended it might be yeah whatever within two hours of the last boot so when the system wakes up the timer basically starts from that boot point one of the reasons why we do this is we don't want to have you know your system doing the update right as you've just booted the darn thing you know the system's busy with booting you're busy with getting your work started who cares if there's a new update waiting you're not going to immediately reboot again just after you started working right so we let the system pick a random time within the first hours of first two hours of booting it'll happen and then unlike on regular micro OS, there's no automatic rebooting here you just get a nice clean automatic notification saying there's an update ready waiting for you and then you can restart whenever you feel like it i've said this a few times and i'm gonna probably keep on saying it you know the transactional updates you know ideally shouldn't be used all the time for installing random packages because they can modify the base os but this time to work you might need to do this you know you might want to be uh you know but you might want to be adding a package for testing to then contribute it to, to the micro os desktop as you know a new part of the base os right so you know in order to do that it's a simple case of running transactional update pkg in the package name or rm the package name yes that is way longer than zipper yes that's kind of the point you know i keep on saying you shouldn't be doing this all of the time the same way you would on a traditional system having a long name kind of helps discourage that um and of course there's going to be those cases like complicated third-party applications nvidia drivers with run scripts and all that kind of nonsense um you know if it isn't a nice clean rpm but in fact some kind of command or script you have to run instead then you can use transactional update run that will then create a btfs snapshot and then run the command inside that environment um, whichever one of those you pick, pack, adding a package, removing a package, etc. Um, in the default typical behavior, after you run that, you're going to have to reboot to make that change apply. Um, if you want, you can daisy chain a bunch of those commands together. Um, you just have to run each of those commands with minus minus continue. So, you know, they know, okay, I'm adding this package and then I'm continuing from that and I'm adding the next package and then I'm continuing from that and I'm running the script. Um, if you forget to do a continue, then you're starting fresh. That's, again, fitting in with the mindset. By default, we're wanting to move from a fresh, clean environment to a fresh, clean environment, always always moving the system in a known state. So you have to worry about that when you're running transactional update. And yeah, as I've said again, and I will keep on saying, you know, tinkering with the base OS can undermine this whole concept of the system being nice, reliable, and supportable. You know, so please do it as sparingly as you can. If you do it and it all goes horribly wrong, that's fine. Everything can always be rolled back. So rolling back the system to the last known good state is a simple transactional update rollback last. Um, this of course can also be done when you're booting a system. You can boot to the last good snapshot from Grub and then run that command in that snapshot to get the same effect. One of the reasons why we have this transactional update command with rollback not using Snapper um, is because Snapper doesn't know about things like how we handle ETC. So if you do just a Snapper rollback, you're not going to roll your config back as well. So don't, don't use Snapper for anything besides listing snapshots. So if you're going to be really fancy and not just wanting to roll back to the last state, if you need to have a list of snapshots, that's the one use case for Snapper in the Microsoft desktop. <laughs> like you snap a list get your list of snapshots find what point do you want to roll back to and then you can roll back to that point and so the future what's next for the micro s desktop you know it's been in release candidate stage for quite a while now why haven't i released it yet um you know what's coming in the future well I'm going to release the micro desktop, but first I have a bigger problem right on my desk right now, like a big micro problem. You know, there's a constant increase of distributions with micro in the name in the OpenSUSE or SUSE ecosystem. You know, we have micro OS and we have leap micro and we have SUSE Enterprise micro and we have the micro OS desktop. 
and we may have one or two more coming in the future. And, you know, all of them, apart from the Microsoft desktop, are server operating systems. And all of them have that same kind of original micro OS mindset of being a server OS and automating all the problems away and, you know, all that stuff that makes perfect sense in a server world. And then there's the micro OS desktop, which, you know, we inherit a whole bunch of the same ideas, but then desktops are weird, desktops are special, you know, like I described at the beginning, right? So the micro OS desktop is like this odd one out. And, you know, we therefore do things a little bit differently. You know, some of the default configuration is a little bit different and, you know, little tweaks here and there because we're trying to make everything as perfect out of the box as possible. And that makes sense in a desktop environment, but not necessarily a server one. And then we have a growing user base and they're really enthusiastic about it. And everybody's talking about it on, you know, Reddit and social media and Bugzilla as well. And, you know, we have issues too, it's not perfect. But when they do, they talk about it as micro OS. They don't say the micro OS desktop. So <laughs> we spend an awful lot of time trying to figure out, is this person actually talking about micro OS, the micro OS server that, you know, is the base for this whole <laughs> growing ecosystem of stuff? Or are they talking about that weird desktop thing, which Richard started and is now kind of growing out of hand and does everything a little bit different. And so, yeah really we need to fix that problem first like you know it's a different product with a slightly different concept sharing the same heritage of course but the micro OS desktop is becoming more and more obvious it's not micro in the same way as the other micro servers out there and so a couple of weeks ago now um started a whole bunch of discussion in the community about renaming the distribution uh, a whole bunch of of names came up um things like Emerald were actually my favorite. Um, but the one that really stuck and especially stuck with the, the contributors to the, the platform, the ones in Telegram and, and Matrix and, you know, who are adding to this thing the whole day is Aeon, Eon. I don't really care how you pronounce it. Um, you know, if you're using it, that's great. You know, it's a name, it's short, it's got four letters, it's cool. It means something cool, you know, an immeasurably long period of time we're rolling release. We're going to be supporting this thing forever. The name fits nicely, you know, and a power existing for eterni from eternity. Well, we're coming from Tumbleweed. It, it fits on both levels of the dictionary definition. And it doesn't uh, overlap with any other weird namings or anyone else's naming schemes. It's cool. It's trendy. It's the new name for the micro OS desktop. Um, this, you voted here first. This is the first time I've said that out loud in public. There's not going to be any major technical differences. You know, everything I've been talking about when I've been saying micro OS desktop, it's going to be the same. Um, I'm planning to have it seamlessly migrate from micro OS desktop to Eon. Um, the, there might be a little bit of a delay on getting that happening um, because one of the things I want to do with this is also build Eon as like an Alp like product. So, really borrowing from what Susan are doing with, with Alp and you know having the the build system be way more modular and have products split differently from their code bases and stuff like that some of that is a little bit academic um it's not like eon's going to massively benefit from it because we already do a lot of that stuff anyway in factory split from from tumbleweed but that's the point like we did it in an experimental way with micro OS in the first place now there's a nice structure it would be really cool to use that nice structure and stop with the dirty hacks. And if I'm renaming something anyway, I might as well build it with a new name in the new in the new way. So we're going to be doing that. I expect it's going to take me you know, a couple of weeks, worst case, couple of months to, to get that all up and running. And in essence, if you want to, you could argue this makes Eon like the first open SUSE Alp like product that's likely to get out there unless things change. We'll see. It's an experiment. Worst case, if it doesn't work, we build we build things the old fashioned way and we just change the name. Um, but if we are doing things a newfangled way, we're probably going to end up using a gamma as the installation method. I'm not a huge fan of Yast in the context of microOS and especially in the microOS desktop. Like, you know, if you go back to again the mindset I was talking about earlier, you know that mindset of micro OS and the micro OS desktop versus Yast where everything's an option and they're all there and yeah, you can tweak and tune everything. 
we have so many bug reports from people who have dived into those options no matter how hard I try and hide them and then you know make a completely unbootable system and then it's a bug for me to fix it's like no it's an unbootable system because that's how it's designed a gamma does a lot of this stuff better it's designed with a lot of that in mind there's still going to be plenty of knobs to tweak and tune for there who people who want to customize it but I think it's going to be better aligned so I really want to look at using a gamma as the main installer and with that I'm going to stop talking about the MicroS desktop now and start just talking about OpenSUSE Eon um, but if you want to join us with Eon then please go to this link which is still currently saying MicroS desktop but will soon also redirect to a new location for the new thing with the new name and yeah join in download it give it a shot feel free to contribute and um hopefully i'll get to see you guys all soon and uh yeah please let me know what you all think i look forward to hearing from you have a nice conference